Yeah. Um, I believe you can all um, see yeah, my presentation good. now. Thank you, Richard. Yeah, great. Well, um, yeah, thanks for, um, thank you for having me. Um, as Alan said, it was um, a year or more ago, I met Alan um, when I did a, a talk um, to a, the agricultural industry and Alan asked me if I'd come along and talk to this organisation, which I, I like to do. I like to spread the word for demolition of what we do and, um, um, and what I do and and uh, and a little bit about what my my industry and my own company are about. And so... Just, yeah, great. So a, a very little bit about me and my organisation. I think it is the very whistle-stop tour of myself. It's, um, I did an apprenticeship restoring E-type Jags, old sports cars, and um, at the age of 20 decided uh, a change would, would do me well. And um, with uh, my father guaranteeing me a loan, I went out and I bought a JCB digger with, um, with no experience whatsoever and uh, managed to build myself a higher roundup. And very, very quickly, um, things, things changed. And a few years in, one of my good customers asked me if I could uh, knock down a fuel station because he was going to build some houses. And uh, I thought, yeah, why not? I can do that. And uh, I would say that naivety and youth were on my side. Um, and I, I knocked the fuel station down. Um, knowing what I know now, I think I broke every rule in the book. Um, from all sides of things but what I did learn was that I enjoyed it um, I made a few quid and thought I'm, I'm going to have a go at demolition and if I'm really honest having poked around a little bit I thought it's quite a dark industry quite a black art and I probably want to come at it from a different angle which is which is what I did and, um, um, and gradually built up the organisation to what it is today which um, um, we're not the biggest um, but um, we're, we're we're, we're well up there and but I, you know I try to do things a bit different and a lot of what I'm about is you know demolition can be seen as quite a, um, a rough or industry and and a lot of it I'd say is rightly so you know a lot, a lot of the times I don't think it helps itself but there are a few of us that are trying and trying to do it different and um, I'm very involved with the Institute of Demolition Engineers um, I, I sit on the Council of Management. In fact, I'm currently the president of it at the moment. Um, and some and things I've, I've got involved in things such as um, it's I can't believe it's six years ago now. A few of us said, you know, we should have raised, raised professionalism of demolition and the academic side. And we we came up with um, a foundation degree and a master's degree. And funnily enough, um, delayed due to the coronavirus. We have our first foundation degree graduation on Friday, which I'm really excited about at one of our seminars. So that's great. And the, the master's degree is there as well, which we help develop. And uh, at the end of helping develop the master's degree, who we, we do in collaboration with Warhampton University, I asked um, Warhampton University if um, they'd give me an honorary degree, which they said, no, if you want it, you've got to do it. So... Um, I did it, and I, I have to say, being very unacademic, it was one of the biggest challenges of my life. And uh, but this time last year, I, I passed, and I'm looking forward to my own graduation um, in July this year. Um, and then, then as I say, raising competency levels. It's all about that education, different qualifications, pushing that, and and something that I'm very, very passionate about is sharing lessons learned. One of my current challenges, which I'm trying to do, is trying to get a lesson learned forum going for, to share a best practice, but also to share when things, when things go wrong. So in, in, um, in January last year, um, we had one of our demolition rigs drop through a basement, um, which you know, quite a lot of people would be, oh my goodness, this has gone terribly wrong. And, and we had nobody, nobody hurt, or you know, even if we did, my my tact is we should share what what we learned from it, what what you know, what we could have perhaps done better, and hopefully by sharing, help the industry along. And um, and so that's um, 
that's what we did. And I shared it all over the internet and I talked about it and et cetera. And, and I'm trying to get our industry, because I, I, from what I can tell, lots of other industries are brilliant at sharing lesson learned and be, best practice. But um, I don't think the demolition industry is. So that's something that I'm working hard to try and do. Um, and within, you know, our own internally, um, we, we don't know, we share these type of things, but then as you can see here, we did, um, we did an alert, which we pushed out to the whole industry. And I'm trying to get some momentum in this thing going. Um, and I mean, our lessons learned to come out of it. I won't, I won't bore you with all of the, um, all of the detail, but we came up with a flow chart and things to do and not to do to try and get to us because to have a, a demolition machine not go through a void is an incredibly difficult thing if there's a void there because how do you know if the void's there or not and it was a, it was a, one of the most challenging uh, incidents for us to learn from to try and get better practice um at ar um and um, i will mention ar once or twice that we we're always innovating trying to um come up with things and You'll see from the slide there, they're all in-house innovations that we've come up with. Um, the, the top left is a, a dust suppression unit, which when you buy these things, traditionally they're ground mounted. And we thought we could do a better job. And we, we came up with a, a system of a, a water tank that fits to a telehandler with the dust suppression on it so that we can put a bit very targeted with our dust suppression uses a little amount of water and when it does run out changing the water tanks just like a cassette um the next picture the big uh blue frame um something i'll touch on more I'm, i've written articles about i don't like to see scaffolding used as a protection screen in demolition so we've tried to come up with something more industrial um a more designed approach which has been very successful for us uh, the top right hand corner rather than continuously hire cranes. That's actually on the eighth floor of a building in Leicester as we speak. We designed and built our own crane for lifting plants between floors. And, um, and then the, the bottom right hand one is just something as simple as we built a test rig in our workshop for testing and repairing our attachments rather than trying to manually, well, not you won't manually handle those, but roll them around the workshop with a forklift. So we're always trying. So. Moving into demolition itself, a lot of you will be aware, a lot won't, but generally we, we have demolition, um, deconstruction, and more and more now um, decommissioning. So where we're cleaning tanks and vessels and pipe work and that type of thing. Um, the techniques, everybody asks me about explosive demolition. Very rarely is explosive used. It's a, it's a last resort type thing for me. Um, uh, wrecking balls, I've never seen a wrecking ball work in my life, believe it or not. Um, high reach demolition is something we do a lot of. More and more remote controlled. Top down is terminology that we use if we're going to almost reverse build something. Um, uh, so just, just as it was put up, we're trying to do it in reverse. And then sometimes we get involved in hydro demolition using high powered water. And then hand demolition, which is part of the the reverse process. Um, from a client point of view, I think it's in, important and, and in, you know, engagement with a good contractor. Um, we have some amazing clients uh, with a good attitude and a good, good approach that talk to us about our competencies and our resources, our previous experience and our, our accreditations. This is an important one really because um, a lot of time people are just looking at the bottom line with price and you know which is is not always the way i mean you know as we know as um or that it's a client is responsible for employing a competent contractor and I, and I don't want to make you know this thing completely about ar when somebody's um employing a demolition contractor or another trade you know they, they should be looking for all of these skills um this can be a controversial slide because um CDM versus demolition. I sometimes wonder, does CDM fit demolition? I actually think we should, um, I mean, you know, it's the clues in the title of construction. Um, and I, I think that we should have our own set of regulations. I've talked to the HSC about it. I don't know whether it'll ever come. 
Um, but the problem that we often get is we often find ourselves working in an arena with people that don't fully understand our trade. And, you know, we a principal designer that means well or a main contractor. And the, just sometimes it just doesn't feel like it gels as it should do because, you know, we're a skill in our own right. And, and then even at the design stage, design for demolition, a, a question is, should we be designing structures to be taken down again, or, or even talking to a demolition contractor at the, at the design of a structure about what materials are going to go into it. Because you know, with the, the modern focus on circular economy, I believe we have something to offer at design stage um, when, when structures are designed. Um, just a, a few of the um, codes of practice guidance that we work to. Um, the, British, the British Standard 6187, where well, you can see now it's coming up to uh, 11 years old, so ready for an upgrade. Um, National Federation of Demolition Contractors, they uh, produce a lot, of, a lot of guidance, which is all available on their website. Um, and, then, and then moving back towards a, a project itself, key considerations, uh, planning, you know, stakeholder liaison as early as possible if you're involved in a demolition project, talking to all the stakeholders, whoever they might be, whether it's um, neighbouring properties, people involved in the process, people that are carrying on a site after the demolition contractor. It's all incredibly important. Um, and then things as simple as services and road closures and footpath closures, things that people often think about last minute, but these are the things that need to be thought about very early on, along with um, an asbestos survey, um, a lot of people um, leave that till late on, where it's an incredibly part, important part of the process. And then the actual operational planning, when we land on site, is are people, you know, um, uh, are people uh, that have the right competencies. Method selection, quite often a, a, a method can be driven by cost and people are, are scared to change the method. And, you know, is there a mechanism put in place for that? Exclusion zones, I always campaign for as large an exclusion zone as possible. In, in the mo modern world, we're asked almost to take a structure down with a tiny exclusion zone and not interfere with anybody else's day-to-day -day life. Is that a good or a bad thing? And, you know, I, I had a, a, a project once where an HSE officer was involved at the start and the client was saying, yeah, we've told the demolition contractor this is what they must do and this is the area they've got. And the HSE officer was brilliant. He said, at what point did you ask the demolition contractor what exclusion zone he needs to do the job safely? And, you know, that's the sort of road I think we should be down. Temporary works is a huge, huge thing in our industry now, is, is understanding the temporary works of all the, the things like... Um, all the equipment and things we use, but also the temporary state of a structure when we start work on it. Logistics, we, we traditionally move incredibly um, large pieces of equipment around and we can be moving a lot of materials as we clear a site. And welfare, would you believe that only a, a, a few years ago, we quite often hear the words uh, when we talk to a, a main contractor about welfare. Um, what, what are we doing for welfare? Well, uh, we're not going to bother until you've cleared the site, <laughs> and and you know that that's quite a that was quite a commonplace thing. Whereas welfare is a big deal to everybody from the first day, um, and then environmental controls is what are we doing to protect the environment? When, and a lot of that can be monitoring or actual control measures. And then social value is a, is a huge one um, where we quite often engage with local communities or schools um, and, and anybody that wants to get interested, there's lots of different things that we do, which I will talk on more as the presentation moves on. Um, so I'm, I'm going to flash you through a project that we did, one that was, was a few years ago that we did it now in Nottingham, the Broadmarsh um, shopping centre, uh, sorry, car park next to the shopping centre, which had an incredible amount of constraints, which I will talk you through. I do have a... Um, quick time lapse, which I will show you first.
Yeah, I'll, I'll the, the rest of it, I'll, I'll move on because I'm a bit conscious of time. You've seen the majority of it there. So to give you an outline of the project, um, so the, the, the shopping, the, the car park was surrounded by four rows. We've got a lot of ca cafes and restaurants. Uh, the, uh, the law courts were across one side of the road. Uh, we've got a tram line just to the side of us. The Nottingham inner ring road wrapping around of us. Um, the, where it's, it's just flashed up bridge. The shopping center was to the right of the screen, the car park to the left. The piece of roadway in the middle, the whole lot was elevated. It was actually a bridge between the two. There was some underground shops in one corner of the, the car park. Uh, link bridge from the shopping center to the car park, the shopping center, solicitor's office on the far side, another link bridge. Um, so you can see we've got a lot to deal with. On top of that, there was a district heating main running underneath the structure, a fiber optic um, uh, BT cable and uh, live electric as well. And these are all the things that we have to deal with and plan for. So you can imagine there was a, a huge amount of planning in this project. Uh, there's a multiple stakeholders. Um, obviously we've got the client was, which was Nottingham City Council. Um, and also in two were involved, the people that operated the shopping centre. We, um, and then many consultants as well, and, and a lot of HSC involvement. Uh, I talked about social value. We, we did things where we, we built an animation, we put an exhibition in the shopping centre. Um, we have a, a demolition simulator, uh, which we took that to the shopping centre and let all the, the kids and adults all have a go over the weekend. A thing called Budding Brunels, which is a local college or youngsters interested in engineering. We got those down to site, have a look around. And we also employed work ex experience students on the, on the job. Um, things that we were thinking about was road closures, footpath closures, protection to those live shops. So the, the, the illustration didn't show it too well. The four live shops were actually within the structure that we were demolishing. And then, uh, so there was a lot of engineering input as well. Just to pick up on um, services, we, we noticed from our own stats that uh, services are our, our biggest amount of incidents. You can see from that chart there. Um, we record all of our incidents in great detail and we look at things. And so whenever we're on a project like this, services are the one thing that, well, one of the things that we look at in, uh, in huge detail. Um, and uh, you'll, this is actually year, uh, last year that this uh, information is from. So again, surveys, the amount of surveys that we do on a job like this, we do the demolition survey known as an R&D, a refurbishment and demolition survey uh, for the asbestos. We do a structural survey and there's some party walls involved. So we did some uh, party wall surveys. Um, operational planning, trying to get our team together uh, to talk through the project. Daily task briefings is an important part of what we do. And we involve everybody in that from the senior management uh, all the way to everybody that's actually, um, and more importantly, operational on the side to make sure that everybody knows what they're doing. Um, competencies, a lot of people don't realize there are specific demolition competencies for site laborers through to um, plant operators and contracts managers, um, all umbrella by the CCDO scheme, um, which is, something that I encourage people to look at. And then method selection and planning. So I'm trying to do this at tender stage, also with an eye on things that might change. Things do change with demolition. And you, you'll see a little bit later in the presentation, which I'll talk you through, which I think is really important, something to think about from a safety and, and um, project delivery point of view. Um, phasing, we try and build um, animations to show the phasing that we, how we're going to do a project. It may be a little unclear on that because it's small, but we, 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 we very much are into animations because the, a small cartoon or film is far better than the written word to get people to understand what you're doing, whether it's stakeholders or, um, or even using during the method statement to explain to your staff what you're doing. 
So I've talked about those link bridges. This is a picture of them. So where you can see the, the cars and vans there, they're actually all traveling across a bridge between the two structures. And then we've got these two pedestrian link bridges, which had to come down. Now our original plan for this was we were going to stand the mobile crane on that highway, um, connect to the bridges, cut the bridges, lift them, turn them, drop them onto a low loader. Sounds very simple, it is relatively simple. Having done some more investigation on the road underneath, we found out there was no way was that road underneath going to take a mobile crane. And this, this gave us quite a problem. Now, we, we could have stayed on that tact and somehow tried to make it work, but you, you're then in risk territory. And this is the point that I was trying to make about don't be afraid to change your method. And we talked with the client about this project and said that, you know, it's demolition, there might be change. And we put ourselves in a position where during the tender process, um, we've made allowances for change. Because if you don't, if you contract it in and you've not got change and something changes, you, you are in a world where things can go horribly wrong. And so we, we couldn't do it the way that we wanted to do it. So if I could jump onto the next slide, the top left-hand picture is an illustration of what we wanted to do. The top right-hand picture is what we finished up actually doing. So we, we demolished three quarters of the car park. We left those two corners up with the, um, with the link bridges going from each. And we stood a crane on the footprint of where some of the car park was. Now, the crane was um, now um, um, a 1,000 ton crane. So you can imagine commercially things changed. And the logistics of getting the crane there were massive. It's called the Broad Marsh Car Park because it's sat on a marsh. So the, the, the temporary works that we had to do to get the crane in were enormous and to, and to, and to um, plan and construct the base for it. But what this allowed us to do was rather than stand the crane up on that, that bridge carriageway, we stood it there and we could simply reach to each bridge, connect them, cut them and lift them to within the site, um, which worked really well for us. And, and, you know, it was just a good demonstration of method change. And the bottom two pictures there are just pictures of actually one from the, the highway where the, uh, the bridges were going over. And the other one is when we were just landing one inside. We did uh, one on a Friday night and one on a Saturday night. Um, I mentioned to you about the, the live shops in the corner. So we, um, uh, this is where we, we did lots of work to dem demolish up to the live shops. Um, and then when we got to this point, we then converted our method to debuild, which was planned right from the start, where we debuilt uh, five stories of car park from above the shops. Those shops were never shut once for a minute during the whole of the project. Um, so we demolished up to two sides of them and then uh, took from above them as well. So uh, a lot of planning, a lot of work went into that. And this was why the HSC were particularly interested and they wanted to understand what we were doing before we did it. Um, because we were, we were taking a structure down from around three dimensionally from live shops. So you can imagine there was a, an element of nervousness. Um, and the, the part of that process, um, and I just need to watch time a little bit. So you can see the middle, the middle picture at the top, that's what we were left with, with the four shops underneath. And the, the, the bottom left hand picture is part of the method. We cut everything up and craned it all off. And we, we put some innovations in there. We've got one called Baby Blue, the top left hand picture, rather than putting a crash deck underneath of all scaffold. There's a lot of work putting the scaffold up, particularly through five floors. We built a small mobile scaffold, which was like a crash deck that went under the floor planks that were to be lifted and under anywhere that where a floor plank had gone from. So we'd never got one open edge, albeit it's not over clear. If you look really closely on the bottom left hand picture, you can see that there's a handrail system, which is part of that system, which moves around with us. So we've never ever got an open edge, which is an important thing because we most of us know about the stats of uh, injuries of falling from height. Um, just touching on temporary works, a lot of people aren't aware that something as simple as a hoarding or even a Harris fence panel has to have a temporary works design. Um, and, and a Harris fence panel, the minute you put a sign on it, temporary works don't, it's changed, so another design's needed. And I think it's important that people pick up on those. So I talked about scaffolding 
in, in demolition. Um, something I'm really passionate about is more, more about how do we protect people from demolition. It's just exclusion zone. As contractors, we're not brave enough anymore to say, we cannot do that job without this big an exclusion zone. And something that I campaign hard against is to, for people to stop believing that a scaffold is a, is a protection for a demolition because being really honest about it, if, if, uh, if somebody saw a demolition machine tearing down a structure, would they stand um, 1.2 meters away from that structure? Of course they wouldn't. Put a scaffold up with a monoflex on it and nobody can see, um, people will stand next to that. And it, I just, it just amazes me that, that we're, we can keep doing this and it's something I'll keep campaigning about until it's stopped because it, it's just not the way forward. Good examples of where scaffolding is used in demolition is here. So you know, these structures are all being demolished and the top two pictures towards the right, that's actually a facade retention system um, doing what it says on the tin. But the, other, the others are where scaffold are used for the debuild process, where we reverse builder construction, which is great. Um, and as I mentioned to you, we built the debris frame. This is the Broadmarsh car park again. Um, we know this is big blue. It, it, we can build it up to um, uh, 16 meters tall. It's a very industrial structure with a 50 mil um, timber face on it. And the, the way it works is with quite a lot of Kent sledge in the bottom of it. And we've done some designs and it can take incredible forces of flying debris or even partial collapses. Um, and, you know, and it's very easy to move as well. Again, just to talk about the, the, the things that we often go into without going into huge detail. So when we were doing the car park, the whole car park had got precast concrete panels hung on the outside of it. And on three elevations, we had to take every single panel off before we did the demolition because we were worried about them falling onto the services. We talked about and that sort of thing. And you then get into the world of, well, how are we going to lift the panel? How are we going to fasten to the panel? We put um, a lifting eyes in every single panel, but you can't just bolt a lifting eye in. You've got to prove that the lifting eye is not going to come out. So every lifting eye we put in, the bottom middle picture there is just doing a, a, a pull test on the lifting, on the, on the, um, the socket that we put in to put the lifting eye in. And we did that with several hundred, hundred panels before we lift them down. Um, just a very quick slide that was, this was an illustration of all the different panels, the different weights, um, the sequence, how we'd temporarily, temporarily fasten some and what the lifting eye arrangements would be. Um, as, a, as a business, we our preferred role in demolition, if we can, we like to be principal contractor. We, we really like to be principal contractor because we've got good control of the site. Um, if we ever find ourselves in the subcontractor position, we're often treated like the, the poor relation. And um, it can be annoying sometimes because we have people that don't understand our industry sometimes dictating to us that it's, it's, you've got to do it like this, you've got to do it like that, and probably not asking the right questions. Um, and, and things like welfare, you know, we, we like to put our own welfare on because to me, welfare is incredibly important. We're, we're expecting our, our guys to live out of there when they're not working. It should be clean, tidy, nice. And, um, and even the things that you hire, I don't think are, uh, are good enough these days. So we often, um, we just use our own. Um, environmental controls. So dust is a, is a really big one that, you know, we can, we can monitor the dust, but um, something that we try to do is, um, I mentioned earlier, we make our own devices for dust control, which is something that we've, we've improved on now. We've made different, different ones. And we believe that we can control dust incredibly well now with the technology that we use. And it, um, it was amusing a, um, a few years ago, the first time we spent quite a bit of money on um, um, dust control, how our competition perceived it. And uh, yet, it actually, it can give you a tender advantage. If you do it really well and you sit in a tender interview and you get asked how you're going to control dust, if you've got a good answer, you all of a sudden leapfrogged up the, uh, up the, up the tendering, tendering process a little bit. 
So a, I'm just going to show you a small video. There's no sound with this one. This is a bit of kit that we also built where we, um, the sort of device you can see there is ready available off the shelf. But again, we telehandler mounted it so we could get it around the site. We could be incredibly targeted with it rather than just having that, that device sat on the floor or miles away from the demolition. We can get it right up there where it's all going on and, um, and, and control the dust really well. Um, vibration and noise monitoring is something that we do. And if we're breaking, you know, we set a threshold. If we break that, we look at what we can do to bring those, um, those nuisances down to think about our neighbors. And then uh, waste management, is, is something that well, we find it pretty easy as demolition contractors. Ultimately, we're, we're, we're glorified bin men, aren't we? We'll just clear up everybody else's rubbish. So uh, we've learned how to get rid of waste well and do a good job of it. And one of my goals is to talk, like I said, to the construction industry, to the, the designers, how that we can design things better to produce less waste when we, the structure comes to the end of its life. Um, and then, Another project that I just wanted to touch on briefly was one that we did in Worcester a few years ago. It was a burnt down um, warehouse. And this was particularly interesting because we had to turn on its head quite a lot of our, our processes. And the whole warehouse was burnt down. It was um, an asbestos cement roof structure. And there was a lot of asbestos within the structure. And it, we, were, we were sort of looking at quite a few things fire damage, it was unsafe, the access, we weren't allowed to set foot in the structure at all, anywhere. Um, so we did a lot of work with, with drones. There were some adjoining structures. Um, there was no real information to what we got, no real information to what was in there that was fire damaged. Um, very badly damaged asbestos, no asbestos survey. Um, as you can see there, the weather was actually up against us with part of it, snowing. And uh, the location was in a very busy industrial estate. So we had to think about how we could do things a bit different, um, knowing that we've got a lot of asbestos in there. And so what we did was we came up with lots of different scenarios of plans of work, how we could deal with it. Um, we involved the HSE straight away. Um, we involved a structural engineer very early. And uh, we, we controlled the conditions as best we could. And we employed some extra specialist competencies in a different way. Um, and one of the big things, so we never, ever, ever do, do a demolition job without an asbestos survey first. We couldn't do this job. With, we couldn't put an asbestos surveyor in there. So we agreed with the HSC that we'd build a dynamic and retrospective asbestos survey. So we did the survey as we were doing the demolition. And what we did was we, we, we just employed a, a full-time permanent asbestos surveyor and as we just inched through the structure, we built the survey. And the minute we came across something suspicious, we'd, um, we, we would then deal with that. And we'd, we'd agreed with the HSC as well, a way that we could um, deal with that, bypassing a lot of um, the, what we have to do normally, which is a 14 day notification for the removal. And the HSC would, to start with, they were very focused on the on the project, but as we proved it was working, they, they left us to it more and more, which, and, it, and it worked very well for a, a structure in such a bad temporary state. So a lot of the structure you can see there were brought down mechanically using our dust control equipment, using our, our machinery that we use, different types of attachments for cutting steel, sorting steel, and sorting materials out. Um, Key people in, involved in the job as in, an Institute of Demolition Engineers member, which was myself. Um, and, uh, but the other one was um, introducing a full-time asbestos, qualified asbestos manager, because we were doing asbestos removal and demolition side by side all the way through the project. So we had to make sure that we've got the competencies on site to do that. Um, We've got the structure gone. We all breathed a huge sigh of relief, or you know, really happy with how it had gone. And we started to break up the floor slab to discover that underneath the floor slab, a structure had been demolished years and years before that was asbestos. It was crashed to the ground and concreted over. 
And if there was ever a job that taught me about all risk contracting, this was the one. So we quite often get asked as a demolition contractor, here's a structure, we need you to demolish it, give us a price. We ask, have you got any asbestos information? Have you got any ground investigation reports? And it'll be, no, we don't have any of that. Okay, um, well, we, we need to talk about how we're tendering this then. Well, we just want you to take it at all risk. If you find anything, it's your problem. And I actually did my, my dissertation on this very subject because I don't think people understand where the risk sits and who it sits with and the potential breaches of regulations by um, making somebody go in all risk. And uh, you'd need to read my dissertation to get it all. But the, the, the outcome was um, that the risk never, ever, ever comes away from whoever owns the site. And um, what well, was my opinion, I should say. And, and a job like this. So uh, this project was worth um, getting up towards a million pounds to us before a million pounds was before we found this issue. This issue below the slab uh, would have taken me out of business if uh, if we were an all risk, if we'd have taken it all risk, which then begs the question, if somebody had to taken it all risk, what would they have done with the problem? And this is, again, some things you can probably detect that I'm quite um, passionate about. So with this, we, we came up again with a regime of of asbestos sampling and dealing with it, because not only have we got asbestos cement there, the lower risk asbestos, we'd also got licensed asbestos, the more nasty material in the soil. So we had to carry on with the same um, approach as we did the building demolition. However, we, we also now had to employ ground investigation engineers so that we could deal with ground contamination, asbestos and the removal. So, and, and that, and its own, we got quite a process because of getting materials tested, dealt with and removed. So that project, um, traditionally, we always recycle 98%. Um, that's actually coming down with modern structures, uh, which is, which is another, another subject altogether. But in brief, um, you know, we knocked down some very old structures that can be hundreds of years old, very easy to recycle. We now knock down structures that are 25 years old because they've been built with a design with a 25 year lifespan, which is wrong in its own right, that structures are only lasting 25 years now. And the materials in them, we just can't find uses for. So um, we're, we're seeing that it come from high 90s recycling, creeping down towards 90 now, which is quite worrying. But on this job with with the so much went to landfill because of the asbestos problem. So it wasn't uh, the, the greatest outcome from a recycling point of view. Um, the, the job completion, as I said, we did a retrospective demolition survey. We built a great case study, a detailed case study for this job. Uh, but the most rewarding part was um, working with the HSC on it. Um, we came up with some best practice information on how to deal with fire damage structures, particularly with asbestos. And that was really rewarding that, that you know, we've got the heavy focus on us to start with and we built everybody's confidence. And then at the end, everybody said, you know, this has worked really well. We need to, we need to build some best practice guidance, which is, um, which is what we did. So I think I've, I've really whistle stopped that and tried to give you a touch at um, look at all angles of, of what we're trying to do, what I'm trying to do. Um, I'm hoping that all I've done is probably spark some discussion points. Um, key bit for me there is early stakeholder engagement. I think it's critical to what we do. Um, understanding demolition and the, the, the types of things we can do um, is key to the smooth running. And you know, if any of you have suggestions, because it's all about, you know, working together to do a better job. Um, I'm almost always, always grateful to listen and talk things through. So um, thank you. Thank you for listening. Richard, that, I mean, that was absolutely brilliant. Timing was uh, great as well. <laughs> uh, all, all reflecting your good uh, planning, I suspect, for your for your day-to-day -day job. 
Um, I mean, particularly my learning point from this was you're the master of understatement, an element of nervousness. I think you, you explained it at, at one point there. Um, I wouldn't know where to where to start. There, there's a there's a few questions. There's one specific one actually, which I, I would like to ask first. Uh, and this was Mike Haley. Um, I I will um, I'll summarise it. And basically, he was asking. Um, did you have to negotiate with the client uh, over the uh, time frame for the job, um, you know, for moving the services, etc. But um, if, if Mike Healy is willing to add to that question, you, you can unmute yourself and. Yeah. Go on, Mike. Uh, what it is, my uh, position is as a CDM health and safety advisor with a, a local authority. And what I, I found out when I first started dealing with demolition was that uh, the client will say, we want that down in six weeks without asking the demolition contractor how long it would take. So I think the, uh, the demolition contractors are the experts and therefore it's best to gain uh, a more valued uh, time frame from them. Uh, but also what we do find is that getting services uh, moved uh, can take up a hell of a lot of time getting them all involved. Uh, and the planning for demolition um, is, is critical uh, in that time frame as well. So it was basically, um, I'm probably answering their own question. You, you must have negotiated with Nottingham and Trent, uh, Nottingham, uh, council to get the time frames. Did you have any conflicts with them over the time frames? So um, the the in short, you're exactly right what you say. And again, it's about involving somebody right at the start of the process that knows what they're doing, that they can say, this is how long it's going to re realistically take to do that. Um, and that's a good starting point. Services often catch people out. Um, when I did the, the Broadmarsh project, the, the, the client, the council, were one of the better clients I've ever had. They, they, were, they were talking to us and saying, how long will this take? This is what we'd like. Can it be achieved? But that doesn't happen very often. And um, I particularly like it when somebody gets involved at the start that probably understands. And, you know, hopefully this presentation I've given you is probably giving you a small insight to that. And because we can normally tell people roughly what a, um, how long a service disconnection is going to take or what's involved in getting a project ready. And it's amazing, even sometimes within a, council, a local authority, is some people are saying, oh, we'd like it done that quick. And another department in the same building, highways, will say, well, no, we're not giving you a road closure until then. <laughs> and and it's, it's I, th I sometimes feel like an international peace negotiator trying to get everybody together to get to this the end the end point. I, I hope that answers your question, but I, I think the point is is very early doors. Whether it's uh, and this was my point about CDM, and I'm and I'm not poking at, at, at people that do like what you do. It's about just having somebody that understands demolition early doors because it is so different from construction. Yes, totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both for, for that. I think that's an interesting area. And and, and this um, liaison, I mean, going beyond the local authority we're talking about there and the planning uh, authority, the liaison with HSE. Uh, another point, actually, quite interesting. Um, Simon Roskilly, if I pronounce that correctly, apologies, Simon, but you, you raise an interesting point that... Um, you know, involving HSE in the planning process and what you said about the uh, dynamic risk assessment for asbestos. I mean, that would be music to a lot of people's ears. Um, so, yeah, th that, that good practice, um, you know, that you're, you're developing and sharing with HSE is great. But the one big question is, um, does that bring you into conflict, uh, the dreaded uh, fee for intervention uh, as an ex HSE inspector, as a couple of us on here today, you know, we'd be quite interested in your views on that. Yeah, so that and that's the point of looking at every job job independently, because what we shouldn't now do is say, oh, we've done a retrospective survey once, let us do it again. Only when the job allows it, and that's 
that's the point about staying professional, doing things properly. What is the best for the project? Um, in terms of sharing, actually, um, Jake, uh, I think it was, if, if Jake's still with us, raised an interesting point, thinking, well, uh, you know, as you said, the industry isn't good uh, at sharing. And, you know, there are other industries like that, my own agriculture, for example, as well. So um, how, what can IOSH do? Uh, perhaps, you know, through, there's a lot of construction group members on here today. Um, is that an area for you to explore? There, there's already a couple of people on here said, would like to speak to you, Mark Eden, for example, about transferring risk and so on. So it's something we, we would like to encourage and, and enable and, and help you and, and your institution. Yeah, what, what, what I'm trying to do is, is get a best practice lessons learned forum going, which is partly online, you know, a website where somebody can put, look, this happened to us. They could put it up anonymously or they could put it up as, you know, who they are. Um, that needs to go through a gated system before it gets live online because you'll always get disgruntled employees, people with a grudge putting all manner of things up. And, and but the, the second, so somewhere where you can share lessons learned, but also so a forum where safety practitioners, um, industry practitioners can all get together and just discuss the time that the machine went through a basement, etc. And if, if I can get that to get legs within the industry, it's something that I'm doing joint with the Institute of Demolition Engineers and uh, the National Federation of Demolition Contractors. I'm hoping that its tentacles will spread to organisations like yours. So is it, because it would be great if other parts of industry that yeah. are associated yeah, yeah, with yeah, demolition... Yeah, hi. It's, um, it's Alan here from uh, I Die Demolition. Uh, um, like your... Joins up with us. I, I could hear somebody else in the background there. Um, Michael McEwen might have his microphone on. I don't know, but it, it, whether that was a point to add, I, I'd like to bring in um, Judith, Judith King, uh, because you you had a point there that um, might help in terms of developing that relationship. Uh, do you mean Judith Ward? Because that's me. Yes. <laughs> yes. Excellent. So I'm Judith Ward. So I actually sit on the quality thought leadership in constructing excellence. Um, and we do have lots of partnerships and we are trying to join up lots of dots, but there are an awful lot of dots and it is very fragmented. Um, and to be honest, from my own personal, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I lead uh, the quality division at McDonald. Um, so even though I'm chartered IOSH, that's not really what my day job is. So I do these sorts of things because I'm quite passionate about it. Um, but there are absolutely not enough hours in the day to support efforts in joining these things together. Um, so like-minded people, I quite like coming to these things to find my other passionate people and, and to try and move things forward. And the things about buried services, I did start a bit of a movement with How Was England and the Environment Agency United uh, in a previous life to try and develop the um, buried services, which became finally the Safe Dig Charter. But that took ages to actually get off the ground and get moving. Um, so I'm quite happy to be a maverick and trailblaze, but I, I just think we need somebody. I, I, I mean, I'm working very closely and I am a, a IPA assessor. So I'm very keen to lobby at that sort of cabinet level, uh, cabinet office level to try and get somebody to grab the blinking nettle and actually move things forward in a, in a cohesive way. Um, I do think that there were institutes are not necessarily set up they seem to be in competition rather than in collaboration and that's really worrying for me because I don't think we're going to make a step change in construction and infra we'll have lots and lots and huge pockets of lessons learned and excellence um, but we're not going to have a coherent approach until we start collaborating a hell of a lot better that's just my own poo that's a Jude viewpoint not a Mott's viewpoint by the way I, I agree <laughs> So, so I think the challenge for us, which we won't explore now, but we'll take it offline. Uh, Chilton today, Judith, tomorrow the world. And your people, <laughs> yeah, and, and so this, we, we need to we need to uh, join that up. So, um, if you could uh, email us and uh, communicate after the meeting, Judith, we'll we'll make sure you know. And through construction group as well. Unfortunately, Malcolm Shields, the uh, chair, couldn't be with us today to to um, lead the Q and A, but. Um, if there is anybody from construction group, if you could put your contact details in the uh, in the chat box so we can pick up on that, that that would be helpful to share. I think. Um, 
I'm conscious of time. Um, you know, we, we aim to finish around 4.15, but uh, I think there's a few useful points that we should still pursue. Um, I've got a, a comment here from uh, John Crossan. Uh, hi, Richard. Do you think the development of um, AI and 3D modeling remote operate remote operating will be embraced by the demolition industry. You know, we've heard it is taken off from the design and build side of things. Um, what about demolition? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, we've, we've been using 4D modeling for quite a long time now, um, where we, where we try and do an animation of, of how we believe a project is going to go, because it's so much easier to demonstrate to any stakeholders how we intend to do it. Um, and, there is software available that can predict, um, particularly if you're going to do something like blaster structure using explosives, can predict how it's going to fall, where it's going to go. And um, from what I've seen, that the, the prediction and the actual put together of marry up quite well. Um, so it's it's just something that the, the digital era is something that I think we need to be pushing very hard and keep going. I do think there is a massive, massive future for it. Um, and going back to the the, the digital area with um, with BIM, that information to us, if it all goes as well as planned, is going to be absolutely golden for us. When somebody gives us a, a file and says, there's all the detail of that structure. Because one of the, the huge, huge challenges with demolition is we're dealing with something that we don't know. We don't know how heavy something is. We've got experience and we've got engineers, but you still never know how heavy something is until it's hanging on the crane of a hook or... You know, you, 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 that's just a very basic example. But if you're building a new bridge that you're going to lift up, you design it, you think you know how heavy it is, it's sitting on the floor, you put it on a crane, you go to lift it, you think, oh, the crane's not quite big enough for this, it's, if somebody's got it really wrong. And the world that we're in, it, it's too late to find out the crane's not big enough when you've, when you've, when you've cut it. And so, you know, stored information and artificial intelligence and animations and modeling and virtual reality, I can see going massive in our industry. Yeah, that, that's um, an interesting point. We've had a couple of questions really sort of bring that in about the CDM role, principal uh, contractor and so on, and, and, and where you fit in that. Um, I did touch on that earlier. I'm just trying to scroll through here uh, and having a job. Fran, where are you, Fran? Are you still with us? You missed the beginning, I think. Fran Watkins? Uh, missed the beginning. Do you see yourselves as taking the principal designer as well as contractor role as being good practice? Um, yeah, well, we've done it on several occasions, so I'd have to say yes, we have, we have <laughs> done that. So, and... It, you know, it works very well. And certainly see the, the, the benefits as you as you highlighted it. Yeah, um, and, and, and probably to just elaborate, I have no problem with, with, with constructive challenge because constructive challenge can stop a mistake. And um, I, I, I very much don't want to sound like that other people involved is a negative. I just quite often think the wrong people are involved, which can be a double negative. Yeah. Um, one of my colleagues, Tim, thanks, has just pointed out that Beverly Rouse has had a hand up for a while. I, I can't see everybody on the screen. I was too busy <clears throat> looking at all the chat and the questions and saying what an excellent presentation it's been. But um, hopefully Beverly's still with us. If you want to make your point, you're more than welcome. Beverly there, can anybody see? She's there. Okay. I yes, I am. I am. Oh, well good Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. It's good morning here. And I'm I'm joining you from Barbados. And um, the presentation, excellent and very valuable because I represent the construction sector here in Barbados on the board of NACOSH. The question I really wanted to ask was more a domestic question, and that is. When you go into face-to-face -face meetings, will people overseas have the opportunity to still have access to these valuable um, IOSH webinars? And that was more for you, Alan, <laughs> than for Richard. 
Oh, I, I mean, I think we should do more of this and joined up between uh, groups and industry groups, um, you know, in terms of your your particular angle um, from the uh, rural industries group perspective, which I was involved with before. Uh, you know, I think that's a benefit to members. Um, and uh, I, I don't know whether any of my colleagues on, on the committee would have anything to add to that. I don't mind answering the question. Yeah, please. Uh, so we want to have more face-to-face -face meetings, but really that's going to be based on local engagement. If we have lots of people that want these face-to-face -face meetings, we'll start having them, but in no way are we stopping webinars. It's clear that this has been a great way to engage with people on a much wider field, including, as you say, people from Barbados. We've got quite a lot of international people coming on onto them. So no, the, most of them will still be webinars with the occasional face-to-face -face mixed in, depending on how much interest there is. Excellent. Thank you. And, and I was going to say the long distance award went to Kurt Cadet out in Trinidad, but I'm, I'm not sure my geography in that part of the world isn't very good. Hello, Kurt. Thanks for waving. <laughs> Uh, but uh, yeah, we, we've got people from, from from all over the place, and Kurt was even a committee member, and Tim's over in Sweden himself. So, yeah, you know that's something we want to encourage. We'll keep that going. Obviously, I, uh, IOSH is is looking at its structure. We don't know what will pan out from that from the discussion, but it's quite clear that you know we've got to carry on in this um, hybrid world. Um, our face to face meeting. It, we feel guilty is excluding so many people, but equally a lot said they want to meet us face to face. And our challenge now is actually getting people to honour that um, that request and build up numbers. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll remind you just when we wrap the meeting up. Um, I, th there's a couple of others, still some technical questions. I'm conscious we just passed quarter past. People are leaving. Uh, do you agree using a hydraulic crusher with long boom? Um, unable to cut the reinforcement in the RC, my apologies. Uh, and in this connection, oh dear, screw. Uh, yeah, and, Alan, I can I can help with that. Can you read it, please? Yeah. So the, so um, uh, Charles is basically asking if um, if there's a there's a reinforced concrete beam and we use um, a, an excavator, a high rig, well, a demolition rig, a high reach demolition rig with a concrete crusher on the end to crush the the concrete um then you know it's inevitable that you might have to send somebody up to cut the rebar so technology has moved on now so we we have several different options we now have concrete crushers um that as um in in the in the you've got the jaw that crushes the concrete in the back of the jaw now there's there are metal shears in there so you can crush the concrete engage more onto it and then the, the in the back of the jaw, jaw cut the rebar now if that's not suffice um we uh, we 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 now have technology hold on i'm looking i have a prop to hand so i have a um a, a demolition excavator here a model of one of ours so we have the different attachment on the end here we now have technology where we can change between these attachments so this particular attachment on this machine weighs nearly five tons and the, the operator can change this attachment in 20 seconds without leaving the cap. So he can be, or, or he or she can be crunching concrete. And if the, if the metal cutter in the back of the jaw can't get through the rebar, he just simply drops this attachment off, puts a steel shear on, goes up with a steel shear, cuts the rebar. Puts, takes the shear off, puts the, the, the concrete cracker back on, and away you go. And so you, are, you don't have to be face to face to have a demonstration. No. And, and, and actually, just, just something to point out, you know, this, this technology was a game changer for our industry, being able to change attachments. That has now moved to the point of where the driver can change his, his whole arm off the machine, again, without leaving the cab. So to have a high reach arm on, it's four and a half minutes to go from high reach to standard without leaving the cap. So that just shows, I mean, I remember 20 years ago, I'd read the magazines with excavators and lorries for sale and it, there'd be a beat up, destroyed excavator. And the, the words at the bottom would say, ideal for demolition. And we've now moved to the point of the, the bespoke equipment we we Investing now is just astonishing and, and so good at its job. 
And, and, and at the other end of the scale, Richard, um, it, not, not high tech solutions like your dust suppression, just sticking, uh, you know, the, the, the water generator there, on, Mister, on on a on the end of a telehandler. It's, you know, it's 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 fairly basic stuff too. So from the health, incredibly protection. basic, but incredibly yeah. effective, and yeah, and it's the type of years ago people would say there's dust coming out of that job and the cars will be covered and people will be covered and it was accepted. Well, now it's not acceptable. So we have to come up with tech to, to get over the problem. Uh, well, listen to other volunteers um, <laughs> while, while Alan's frozen. Um, were there any other questions from the members? As a brief open floor before we wrap up. So I see. I see. Somebody's asked about if if the models are available commercially, <laughs> and, and says that for his son, I promise. But uh, you, there is a whole movement of model collectors, um, massive industry, and people can make what you want. Um, we have those commissioned, but you pretty much can get them commercially if you look around on the internet. Well, if there's, uh, if there's no other questions, thank you very much, Richard. It is very informative and very interesting. It sounds to me like deconstruction may be as difficult, if not more difficult, than construction uh, in many different ways because of all the parameters. Uh, you're certainly very constricted by many different um, parameters in terms of taking down shops on top of shops in a building next to a main circular road in Nottingham because I know the Broad Marsh quite well. That was an amazing contract, and thank you very much for sharing what you did in it. Yeah, Very my positive. absolute pleasure. And, 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 and that is the point. It, everybody is, is in their world. Um, it's technical, but we've, we've moved away from that. Just smash it up. And it is very technical and very challenging. And, and, and I, I campaign for people understanding that. Yeah, the, the days of Fred Dibner blowing things up are perhaps gone. I, I think he'd be in prison if he did what he did it while we did it there. <laughs> Which is a nice to watch. Yeah, yeah, okay, exactly. well, th yeah. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. It's been a, a successful branch meeting for us. I posted a link as well with regards to that question about um, watching the branch meetings. Uh, all of our branches put on um, different shows, uh, presentations uh, up and down the country and all over the world. Um, but that link, it's a little bit embedded in the central IOSH um, uh, website but if you follow that link uh, literally have a look every now and again you'll see all the different webinars up and coming um, but you do have to be a member to get the link sent to you I believe so just uh, just yeah follow that link I sent and um, you'll, you'll have all the webinars as well as of course the IOSH formal webinars as well Alan's back yeah sorry about that Tim my, my I've had um, terrible internet the last few days since the storm <laughs> I think um, yeah, I, I don't know how far how far you got, but uh, I was sharing this slide. That's what I intended to do. Have you managed to speak about that? No, no. No, no, I was just thanking Richard uh, and everyone being here and highlighting the link that gets people to be able to watch things like this for free without being a member. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, as you said, the information's on. The recording will be on YouTube. Richard kindly agreed to share that and his PowerPoint. I mean, there's so many good things we need to, uh, behind the scenes, bring some of this together. We will capture all of the uh, the chat as well. Um, I know uh, Jane, get a name, uh, sorry, Judith, I've got that bit wrong, Judith Ward uh, has agreed to, um, you know, follow this up um, with Richard as well. So we'll do what we can, Richard, um, with, our, with our colleagues in, in the construction group, and we'll have some discussion with them uh, for sure. So. Just looking forward, um, the meeting on March the 1st, you know, this was in response to members saying they wanted face to face, uh, but uh, we'd love to see more than have currently signed up. So if you certainly can make it on the day, uh, you know, wherever you're from, but um, we'd, we'd, we'd love to see you. It's a great opportunity uh, to talk about, you know, future technology as well as um, where we are with Catch the Wave and so on. Um, in April, we're going to be looking at recruitment. Uh, and, and obviously what we can do to help others about preparing for the, you know, for your future jobs. It's our AGM as well. Uh, so that's when the new committee will um, be up and running. 
uh, but please sign up by March the 1st. Uh, myself, I, I'm afraid I will be standing down, but uh, still involved with the committee. It's a great committee, good fun. Uh, and uh, we've been meeting virtually. It'd be nice to see each other face to face. Although, Tim, we won't be seeing you, sadly, uh, and Kurt from distant, distant uh, lands. Um, in May, we'll be talking about driving safety. Uh, that's uh, on the road. Uh, we're just developing that one. Uh, and um, June, progressing through the IOSH grades. But for me, what I look forward to is, is our summer school. Those who followed us and our numbers grew immensely last summer when we did our back to basics. Uh, there is inevitably still a call for this. And so the basics are back, B2, B2. Uh, our summer school will come up with about six virtual sessions. We'll be filling in some of the gaps that we didn't cover last summer. So watch this space, follow us on LinkedIn and uh, other social media are available. I'll, I'll show a slide on that in a minute. Uh, and then another thing we want to do during the summer, what do schools do? School kids, they have a summer visit. So we uh, we are planning to go to a, 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 their large research-based university campus, uh, Cranfield in particular. They're involved in aeronautical research, uh, mechanical, road safety, autonomous vehicles, welding, 3D modelling, all sorts of fascinating stuff going on there. It's a postgraduate research university. So, uh, and then in the, towards the end of the year, Q4, 4Q, however you want to say, academic presentations from university students. Again, we're looking to develop our relationship with people coming into the industry and encourage people to come into, uh, you know, into our, our role to become uh, health and safety professionals. Uh, we'll have our usual legal update as well, and uh, hopefully an end of year branch event. And who knows, that might even be face to face with a bit of luck. Uh, I know the question was asked about these meetings uh, where we can uh, project and involve, uh, you know, project the speakers' presentations and involve others. Uh, that does depend on the venue and uh, getting the the. the the uh, equipment, the IT equipment necessary to do that. But yeah, we'd, we'd love to see you all and to uh, keep encouraging uh, involvement and support for our branch. And meanwhile, you can engage with us uh, plenty of different ways, obviously, through, um, through the social media, LinkedIn in particular. Uh, we, we've got uh, plenty of members on there now. Is it over a thousand? I think, did we reach that target? Um, Twitter as well. We're around 750 members on there. Um, I think you've already mentioned, Tim, you can you can uh, access our pre all of our previous meetings through our recent events page on our Chilton microsite um, and, and the slides, recordings, chats, all of those things are available. Uh, if I've missed anything, any committee members want to add to that? We, we're also supporting the future leaders. Um, as well, and we've, we're, we're glad we've got a couple of uh, members of, of that group on, on our committee too. So we've got a lot to look forward to, busy year, uh, and hope to see many of you again. One last chance, anyone from the committee? Yeah, just um, one thing, Alan. Uh, we're, we're aiming to use link, our LinkedIn uh, committee page uh, as our main portal of communications, if you like. We'll, we'll have yep. our website and Twitter and things like that, but as, as a central hub for events and uh, and also the links for the recordings and any Q&A uh, follow-up or anything like that, we're, we're going to be using the, the LinkedIn uh, committee page going forward. Um, you can find other things in other places, but that's, that's the main uh, hub, really, of what we're doing. Okay. Um... So I just, I just, just quickly to add on on that. Um, the beauty of LinkedIn is it's um, industry uh, and profession agnostic. So, um, for those of you that may not be members of the Chiltern branch officially with IOSH, you're you're more than welcome and very welcome to uh, follow the uh, IOSH Chiltern LinkedIn page um, to to get content and, and collaborate with us. So it's uh, it's a much easier way for us to reach to everyone that's interested in um, in safety uh, within all industries and sectors. OK, so um, I, I've just spotted one observation, which which, you know, it, it fits for me. If we've missed any questions, we'll, we'll follow that up from the from the chat afterwards. Uh, but uh, thanks for everybody for being with us. But um, just to reflect, um, 
back to, to Richard for an excellent presentation. Uh, Pippa Gardner says, brilliant insight into something you see all the time. <laughs> can now won't be able to walk past the job without this um, inside knowledge. So uh, you've done your bit, Richard. You've you've raised awareness, uh, uh, you know, through, well, we had uh, over 150 people at, at one point during this presentation. Um, but going beyond that, I think we had something like 470, nearly 500 registered so that they could download the recording afterwards. That's the key. It doesn't end with just this presentation. Uh, and uh, it, it'll spread far and wide and it'll be there for perpetuity. So, Richard, you've done an excellent job for you and your colleagues as president of the Institute. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, there were no shameless adverts for AR, AR demolition, but uh, just to see how you grew that company from, you know, one man band with a JCB you know, who, who we all see too often really uh, and uh, to, to where you've got today is an is a absolutely fantastic achievement congratulations on your academic qualifications as well I mean just setting those up for others but then um, to actually sit them yourself so so well done on the uh, on the masters <laughs> even if you didn't get a freebie you did it the hard way yeah no um, no wonderful thank you very much and um, yeah I, I I am very proud of AR. I'm proud of what I've achieved, particularly as um, um, so my really quick story, but it's it's amusing. It's worth a quick listen. Um, I remember when I got the uh, um, uh, my parents booked to go on a holiday, and uh, I remember saying, "Mum, you've managed to book a holiday over my maths exam when I was doing my GCSEs." And uh, Mum said, "Oh no!" She was devastated. Went into the school. And she said, uh, mum said to the maths teacher, look, is there a way that when we're going on holiday, we could contact a local school, get an invigilator, get the exam faxed over and, uh, and he can sit and do it. And the maths teacher looked at my mother, I was there and said, Mrs. Dolman, knowing what Rich is like at maths, you take him on a holiday and enjoy your holiday and don't worry about sitting the exam. <laughs> and uh, A, it was rather motivational. <laughs> And B, it, I still look back and smile knowing now that I've, I've done an MSc and it just goes to show I was so uninterested at school, but I'm very interested in what I do, which motivates you. Mother will be so proud as well. Yes, well, she is. <laughs> Great. Good to hear. Well, you know, what else can we ask for? Um, there's lots of new names to me, so many of you are probably from Construction Group. I think we'll, we'll wrap it up now that we can uh, finish off the recording. As I said, um, if there's any any loose ends um, we, we haven't managed, um, we won't bury them. We'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll raise them from the ashes. And uh, yeah, anyway, that's enough analogies. So uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, Richard, if you want to stay on just for a few minutes afterwards and committee members, uh, Paul, and uh, we'll finish the recording. Will you hand in that, Tony? Thank you very much, uh, but do follow us anyways. Great to have seen so many of you.